we are uh, about to get started. Um, again, for all of those who have joined, uh, my name is Tim Hoglund. I am the Interim Director of Communications over at CDT, and we are terribly excited uh, that you all joined us today. Uh, we would love for uh, this conversation to get started. Uh, and I'm gonna kick it over to Lisa Hayes. Lisa. Thanks, Tim. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you were able to join the Center for Democracy and Technology. I'm coming to you from CDT's Washington DC office, which is incredibly dark and quiet and still this morning. And that's because CDT's US office and CDT Europe in Brussels are closed with our staff working remotely in the interest of public health. The dark and echoing hallways around me reflect that this is truly an unprecedented moment for the modern interconnected world. COVID-19 has brought our daily lives to a screeching halt, and we will be feeling its impact for years. That said, we are incredibly encouraged by the early signs that technology and data may play a pivotal role in defeating COVID-19. CDT's incredible team is engaged with the COVID-19 response effort on a variety of fronts, from working to improve the online experience for students to ensuring the cybersecurity of the upcoming U.S. elections. Through all of this work, our overarching priority is to ensure that democratic principles and human rights are embedded in any COVID-19 response. This is the first of a series of webinars that CDT will be presenting on COVID-19 and its impact on digital rights. Today, we will be exploring gaps in US privacy and surveillance law that are laid bare by proposed responses to the spread of the coronavirus. Our panelists will be addressing issues that include the types of data the government is seeking to combat COVID-19, the surveillance and consumer privacy laws that are supposed to protect that data, and the principles that policymakers ought to consider when determining whether to obtain and utilize the data. How is the data protected? And if it isn't well protected, what are the implications for consumers' willingness to share the data to help fight the disease? We have an outstanding panel of CDT experts to help us understand these issues. Greg Nojime is the director of our Freedom, Security, and Technology Project. Greg will help us understand how surveillance law plays into the coronavirus response. Andrew Crawford, our policy counsel on our privacy and data team, will focus on the limits of the laws protecting our health data and the absence of a baseline consumer privacy statute in the United States. And Jens Henrik Jeppesen, our Director for European Affairs, will contrast the U.S. experience with that of the EU, which does have a baseline privacy statute, the GDPR, and will help educate us on how the GDPR is being interpreted in this crisis. Before we get into this discussion, a few quick housekeeping notes. We're scheduled to run until 11.45 this morning Eastern, and we are recording this webinar. The video will be available after the event. Some of you have already submitted questions for the panelists, and we will do our best to address those questions throughout the session. If you are joining us via computer today, please feel free to use the chat function to privately submit questions directly to Tim Hoagland, CDT's Interim Director of Communications. You can start a chat with Tim by opening up the participants panel, hovering over his name, and then clicking on the chat icon. Tim will collect all of your questions and share them with the panelist. You can also submit questions via email at questions at cdt.org. That's questions with an S at cdt.org or via Twitter at hashtag CDT questions and at sendemtech, CDT's Twitter handle. If we are unable to get to your question during today's session, please feel free to follow up with us directly after the event. Let's get into it. Greg, I'll start with you if that's all right. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about what types of data governments and government health authorities are seeking to fight the spread of COVID-19 and, and what do they want this data for? So there's a variety of types of data that they're seeking. Um, the data include location information um, generated by the operation, for example, of an app or a cellular telephone. Um, and some of the providers are volunteering aggregated location information in the form of mobility data showing where um, the travel trends are. 
So they can show, for example, the extent to which stay at home orders are being abided by uh, and whether people are reducing their travel to business areas, to downtown areas, as would be expected if they were complying with stay at home orders. So um, this kind of aggregated data, I think, is very useful and um, if properly aggregated doesn't have the same kind of privacy implications that individualized data would have. In addition, um, there's discussion about providing proximity data. That's information showing how close you are or were to a person who is infected with COVID-19. Uh, uh, this proximity data is not yet being um, made available. It'd be on a volunteer on a voluntary basis under most of the models being discussed, but apps are being developed to create this uh, data and this opportunity to share it. And are governments in the U.S. trying to obtain this information? And if so, are, are they successful? And, and what types of entities have it? Uh, the types of entities, start with that, um, uh, your cellular phone provider has, for example, cell site location information showing where you are and where you have been, but not at a very granular level. Um, to our knowledge, that data is not being um, sought to respond to the coronavirus spread because it's not as granular as other data, like GPS data, and um, in particular, like the proximity data uh, of Bluetooth more precise than either of those. Um, uh, so cell phone providers have that data. So far, to our knowledge, it's not being sought. Uh, the uh, apps have GPS data, and there is discussion about whether they would share that data um, or and, and the structures under which uh, it would be shared. Uh, and then there's the proximity data, which is um, being discussed with respect to Bluetooth and the apps being developed. Do you have a sense right now as to whether this data is being currently shared with the government here in the U.S.? To our knowledge, the sharing of the data is mostly at the uh, aggregated level, that um, the information like mobility that I talked about earlier, that that is being volunteered both to governmental entities and publicly. Uh, but we haven't heard of demands for, for example, location information on a significantly different basis than it's been asked for uh, in the criminal context. I, working with you for several years, I know you've said that the law protecting meta metadata like location information is a lot like an ounce of Swiss cheese. Uh, it doesn't cover much and it's full of holes. Could you explain what you've meant by that analogy? Sure, thanks for asking. So um, the electronic communications private which is the statute that protects the privacy of electronic communications, um, only applies to entities that are known as electronic communication service providers. That's something, think of something like an email provider where you're communicating to other people. And providers of remote computing services, think of something like a calendar that you maintain just for yourself online and don't share. Now that's example of a remote computing service. Those providers are the only entities that um, are covered by the protections in the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. That's not much coverage when you think of the uh, range of entities that have personal information about you. In particular, one thing that has concerned us and that we will be writing about uh, in the future is the notion that Though the ECS and RCS providers are covered, if they share data with a broker, for example, the broker doesn't have the same relationship to you that the ECS and RCS providers do. It's not covered in the same way that they are. This data can be laundered to them, and then they can disclose it to governmental entities without the same restrictions that are in ECPA that apply to remote computing services like, your, uh, uh, like the calendar service I mentioned, or that apply to an electronic communication service like an email service 
and, and like your cellular telephone provider. So this, this idea that the data can be laundered and then loses its protection, that's a problem. Okay, you, you've got me. And perhaps this is because I'm working from home these days, so I'm fixating on the word laundry. But could you dig a little bit deeper on data laundering uh, and explain precisely what is that? Because um, I think I would like to get away from laundry these days. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it sounds like a dirty word. I, I, maybe I shouldn't be using that kind of terminology, but that's what it looks like. Um, uh, one entity that is covered by ACPA, if it shares the data with an entity then it, that does not have the same relationship to the consumer that the uh, collecting entity has, all of a sudden the data isn't, isn't any longer protected by ECPA. It's been laundered. Um, it's not an intentional thing by the entity that is um, perhaps providing data to the broker, but it's the effect. That's the effect. And all of a sudden, the coverage that ECFA has um, goes away. ECFA says that if a governmental entity wants to obtain information that is non-content from an ECS or an RCS provider, there are restrictions. There are rules it has to follow. If it wants to obtain um, location information, for example, it's, it's going to need uh, um, 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 that information, I want, I want to focus on that for just a second. Location information can be volunteered by an entity that has collected it to another commercial entity. It can't be volunteered to a governmental entity, um, such as the U.S. government or a state or local government. Um, it has to be, it can only be obtained in limited circumstances. It can't be freely volunteered but it can be freely volunteered to commercial entities. And then we get that problem where ECPA's limited coverage kicks in and, and it's not as protected as it ought to be. It sure sounds like it's time for ECPA reform, but perhaps we will leave that for slightly later in the discussion. I mean, at this pivotal moment where people are being hospitalized and are dying around the world, I, I think we've met the general standards for an emergency situation. Do any of our laws have emergency exceptions? And if so, why hasn't all of our data already gone to the government in order to battle this virus? So uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act and most other privacy statutes that I can think of all have emergency exceptions. Here's how ECPAS works. And remember, this is for the provider that's covered by ECPA. Okay, so we're only talking about those. And let's use uh, location information as an example. First, there has to be an emergency. The emergency has to involve a danger of death or physical injury to a person. The provider who has the data has to have a good faith belief that there is an emergency. The provider has to have a good faith belief that there is an emergency that requires disclosure of the data without delay. And the data has to relate to the emergency. How does that work? You know, what does that mean? First, it's important to recognize it gives a lot of discretion to the providers. That, it turns out, is a good thing. It turns out that that's a good thing because the alternative, which the government sought in reform, is that the government has all the discretion. The government decides whether there's an emergency. The government decides whether it has a good faith belief that there's an emergency. It requires disclosure of the data. I have little doubt that had that effort to take the discretion away from the providers and give it to the government, that all of our data would have flown straight to governmental entities at the beginning of this crisis, even if it was a very limited utility in resolving, uh, uh, in responding to uh, the, the spread of the virus. So what's the, what are providers doing? I think a good example, we, we've talked to a number of them, and they interpret this emergency exception in a way that to me makes a lot of sense. Um, one hypo I discussed with one provider was when everybody was going down to the tidal basin. Remember that uh, at the Cherry Blossom time here in Washington about two weeks ago? We had too many people going down to the uh, tidal basin to see the Cherry Blossoms. They weren't maintaining social distance. I said, well, that's an emergency. 
And that uh, uh, a knowing that the cell phones of people were close together and clustered in an area would be useful information. And uh, the provider I was talking to said, yeah, but they can see that just by looking out their window. It's, a, it's not an emergency that requires the disclosure of this personal information in order to deal with it. So that's the issue that the providers are looking at. Is it uh, necessary to disclose this information? And if it's not, at least the large ones are telling us that they uh, are going to hold on to that data and they will disclose it when it's really necessary. Okay, let me let me do one more question on sort of government surveillance to make sure we understand the landscape and then Andy, I'm going to pivot over to you. Um, Greg, is US surveillance law hindering government access to communications data in a way that's compromising government ability to respond to the coronavirus pandemic and actually endangering US health as a result? I don't, I don't think so. I think that, um, again, there's a lot of discretion in the providers, uh, particularly with respect to emergencies, that the, and that they are uh, so far telling us that they're making um, responsible decisions and that they are prepared to make disclosures uh, when they are needed um, to respond to the emergency. Uh, Lisa, the rubber's gonna hit the road in the area of quarantine in a probably uh, uh, short amount of time, weeks or months. Um, I imagine situations where governmental entities are going to order a person to quarantine, the person doesn't want to be quarantined and they want to break quarantine, um, that, will, that will be a crime, I think, under most state laws, and that will enable the provider to uh, make a disclosure under current law. Uh, what happens, though, when uh, states start demanding broader amounts of data to enforce quarantine um, without there being evidence that a person has broken quarantine? I'm concerned about that situation. We're going to be looking at it closely and discussing it with our new um, task force on the coronavirus, the one that we just formed, the um, Coronavirus uh, Data for Life and Liberty Task Force. Terrific. Thank you, Greg. And, and I think those quarantine issues and the identification of quarantine leads us nicely to Andy uh, to talk a little bit about some of the health repercussions and the privacy repercussions of some of this data. You know, Andy, the U.S. does not currently have a comprehensive federal privacy law, but we're instead governed by a patchwork of specific laws, either for sectors or within different states. CDT has been advocating for Congress to enact comprehensive privacy legislation. Do you think the current COVID-19 pandemic is giving us additional challenges to passing a federal bill that adequately protects the privacy of consumer data, including health data, such as positive COVID-19 testing? Uh, thanks, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. Um, you're right, CDT has been advocating for a national privacy bill, and a strong reason behind that is because consumer data, including sensitive health data, uh, isn't specifically regulated by any uh, national privacy framework. We do have some protections, though, um, and I'm going to talk about a few of them, uh, especially when it comes to um, health data. So the most important one that I think comes to everyone's mind is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA. Um, HIPAA was introduced in 1996, and the accompanying uh, privacy rules uh, were finalized in 2000. And what HIPAA does is it really regulates uh, entities within the health space that control uh, health data about each individual patient. Um, the entities that HIPAA covers are called covered entities. Those are things that most people, you know, associate with the health uh, care industry, doctors, hospitals, insurers, and also third parties that kind of help those entities do the job of providing health to us. Um, the information within HIPAA uh, is called protected health information. So it's important to note, though, with HIPAA, similar to some of the uh, examples Greg gave in the security and surveillance context, is that if you're not a covered entity, um, the HIPAA privacy protections don't really apply to the data. So you can have data that is held by a medical provider that would meet HIPAA protections, 
but if a patient or consumer were to move that data at the request uh, to a third party uh, app that isn't one of those covered entities under the statute, those HIPAA protections wouldn't follow the data. Um, so there's, there's gaps. Now, outside of HIPAA, there, aren't, there are other backstops. And the most important one there is uh, the Federal Trade Commission Act. So the FTC Act um, has kind of developed over the last decade or two as kind of a de facto um, privacy uh, enforcement uh, bill. And the FCC has taken action in that, mostly under their Section 5 unfairness authorities uh, and deceptive uh, practices. So the FTC Act wasn't designed uh, per se as a privacy bill, um, but the commission has, has utilized it as um, kind of evaluating on a case by case basis and developed uh, a decent amount of case law on it. So we do have a privacy regulator. It's just, it's, it's acting with, um, a, you know, authorities that weren't specifically designed for the privacy challenges we face today. So there's momentum growing in Congress, uh, as most folks know, uh, on national privacy bills. Um, CDT has testified uh, a number of hearings uh, uh, advocating for why we believe this is important. And what's important to note about all those bills is that they include uh, heightened protections for health data. So we're seeing a lot of momentum uh, behind it. Uh, and I think it's it's the COVID, back to your original question, sorry, it's taken so long to get to it. Has COVID made it uh, more uh, pressing? I think the, the answer is um, it's exposed um, that there's lots of health data that's being uh, derived and um, created that falls outside of those HIPAA protections. And it highlights uh, the heightened need uh, to enact clear and meaningful privacy legislation and protections. Uh, we'd all benefit from the clarity and trust that comes from those uh, those uh, new bills uh, that are being discussed. Thanks. Um, you know, companies, academics, governments, civil society, we're all searching for ways to leverage technology and better our response to COVID-19. Are there some core principles that these various policymakers should keep in mind when deciding what types of privacy protections and data practices are appropriate? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, privacy, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing of equities, right? We're, we no longer think of privacy as just an on off switch, um, but it's really balancing the intrusions of any product or program against the benefits of the data use, taking into consideration, you know, potential secondary effects on, on consumers, uh, versus you know, efforts made to mitigate those. Um, so some core elements that I think Greg touched on a little bit that I'll emphasize and add to are um, first a preference for aggregated data. Um, individually identified data um, shouldn't be lose, used if there's less intrusive means. I think Greg gave good examples of what some of the big tech companies are doing when it comes to um, Apple, Facebook, Google, releasing aggregated mobility trends and data. Um, those make it very difficult for folks uh, to identify specific individuals because they're aggregated at, at minimum, I believe, the city level, if not the county level. Um, another point is um, for folks to consider uh, minimization of collection, use, and sharing. And an example would be, if I, as a consumer, want to download an app to monitor my heart rate, is it really necessary for that app to also have access to my location information, my network connection, my photos, my microphone, my camera? If all I really want as the consumer is for basically an app to create a ledger, um, do we really need all those other elements to be collected? Um, another one is purpose limitations, um, data collected and used for the coronavirus um, response. Um, shouldn't be repurposed for secondary uses. For our corporate friends, that means not using this data to target ads uh, based on the, the data that's collected. And for the government actors, it means not using this data for uh, activity that falls outside of the response to the national health emergency. Quickly, just a couple others. Deletion, um, once the data that's collected uh, for the COVID response, um, fully utilized and no longer needed once the, the national emergency is over, um, we should be deleting that data. Um, and we should also make sure that we're building uh, services and protections that identify um, 
and serve all communities. We've seen reports that COVID is striking um, minorities at higher rates, um, and they're more likely, unfortunately, to die from it too. So as we seek technological solutions, we've got to make sure that it's um, serving all demographics and not exacerbating existing um, inequities. Thanks, Andy. And questions are flooding in, and I want to be sensitive to time and also get a chance to hear from Yen. So, so one final question for, for you, Andy, just as we're shaping this discussion. In this context, what constitutes health data outside of HIPAA? What types of data do you think should require additional privacy protections at this moment? Sure. And I hope what I've tried to get to already is there, there's a lot of data that's going to be outside of HIPAA that is probative into uh, health status of individuals and of our communities. Um, existing and emergency and excuse me, emerging technologies, um, as we've seen, are collecting whole hosts of data. Um, I'll go back to the the mobility data again. Um, that that is location information that facially, you know, that that's not health data. But when deployed uh, in a way that is uh, probative into, you know, if uh, social distancing measures are working and used in a way to help inform. Uh, public health officials, uh, I think it's pretty clear that that's, that's being used as health data. So, you know, what, what we should be doing is making sure that the burden's not just falling on consumers when it comes to uh, assessing the privacy implications for, for all the data that's being generated and collected. Um, it's hard for a person to anticipate that their data can become health data when it's being utilized in ways that they never anticipated when they downloaded you know, an app that had no nexus to health to begin with. Thanks. Super helpful. Jens, let's pivot for a minute across the pond. Can you give us sort of the, the big picture overview of what's happening in Europe as opposed to our prior discussion on the United States? Yes, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of similarities, actually, despite the different uh, legal uh, environments. Uh, so uh, the focus is really about uh, what's the right way to use digital technology and, and data effectively and avoid drastic impact on, on privacy and data protection. So um, European governments and authorities have experimented with different approaches uh, up until this point, uh, mostly around using uh, mobility uh, data insights uh, from, from telecommunications networks. Uh, and so these are, uh, these are aggregated and anonymized uh, data sets that the authorities can then sometimes combine with uh, data that, that the health authorities uh, keep and understand how the, how, how the virus spreads and, and how, where there are particular risks. Uh, so these schemes are in compliance uh, uh, with the applicable uh, data protection laws or the general data protection regulation and the e-privacy directive. And same is true for the, for the social media uh, uh, companies. So, so Google and Facebook have, uh, have provided aggregated anonymized data. Uh, but it is a very mixed picture. Uh, uh, contact tracing is a, uh, is a major focus for a, a lot of governments. So uh, at, at, at this point, at least 14 European countries are working on a variety of contact tracing measures. Um, and, uh, and some of them also have uh, regional level initiatives. And just to back to, to, to the point that Greg made, uh, I, I think uh, the most controversial measure that we've seen so far is is the Polish home quarantine app, which requires people in quarantine to periodically send geolocated selfies to prove they're abiding by the quarantine measures. And the app is connected to a database of phone numbers of people who are under mandatory quarantine. And the system checks both the person with the facial recognition and the location. Um, so this is a very diverse picture at this point, Lisa. Okay, so if the member states are creating sort of a diverse picture and all approaching this uh, with, under their own banners, um, what is the EU doing as, as sort of a, its own governing entity? Right, so the European, the European Union institutions don't have a lot of competence in terms of, of acting in, in matters of public health because of the treaties, but the Commission is trying to, uh, uh, to push for a, a, a coordinated approach uh, to the overall COVID crisis management, and in particular, 
uh, on uh, the use of, uh, of technology. So it has recommended a coordinated approach for, uh, for um, contact tracing and warning and a common scheme for using anonymized and aggregated data on mobility. And it has set up a process uh, for European health authorities to work together to make that happen. Um, now, the tool, this recommendation is called a toolbox. It, it references two contact tracing initiatives. So it's called the Pan-European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing um, a Consortium uh, from across Europe uh, with uh, more than more than 100 researchers. Uh, it also references the Google and Apple joint initiative uh, uh, for privacy preserving contact tracing. Now, uh, the commission has also issued guidance uh, with the data protection authorities about um, uh, uh, how to do data collection and contact tracing in a, in a way that's compatible with uh, laws. So in the guidance that the commission issued on the 16th of April, uh, the first thing the commission does is to say that it does not cover initiatives to enforce quarantine. Second thing it says is it discourages member states from passing laws that would make the use of any type of app mandatory. Member states can pass those types of laws, but it's a, they would have to, to meet a, quite a high standard in terms of, of the justification for it. And then it, um, it, it recommends specifically that national health authorities should be data controllers, so responsible for compliance under GDPR and that the individual should be in control of how data is used. Uh, there shouldn't be negative uh, consequences for not using the app. And so, and where the apps have uh, several functionalities, um, so symptom tracking, contact tracing, information provision, uh, uh, the app should offer uh, uh, individualized consent, so not bundled consent to all of these. Um, it discourages use of GPS and uh, cell, uh, cellular location data, and, and it, it, uh, it encourages use of Bluetooth, uh, uh, Bluetooth data and says that uh, the, uh, the data should be stored on the, on the individual's device. Um, I'll stop there, but those are, the, those are some of the main recommendations that, that the Commission has made and that data protection authorities have made at this point. Thank you. Lisa. Thanks, Jens. And there were some really valuable uh, insights in there that pivot very well to one of the questions we've received uh, that I'll throw back open to the group. Uh, Singapore's experience suggests that if you can't get broad acceptance of location data sharing, it won't actually help public health officials. In other words, if only 20% of the population shares its information, it's not useful to assist to assisting health officials in preventing the spread of the disease. Um, if the US and the EU permit these various platforms to only be opt in voluntary platforms for location sharing. Will there be sufficient uptake for these platforms to be effective? Greg or Jens, if you want to weigh in on that. Why don't I start uh, and then Jens, uh, you can follow. Um, think about what a mandatory program would look like uh, a requirement that individuals across the country all download an app on pain of what? If you don't have a cell phone, you're not gonna be required to download the app and the penetration rate for smartphones in the United States is 81%. So we have some limit even in the mandatory world. Uh, if you're required to download the app, are you just going to evade this requirement by buying a second phone? And if that's a risk, how are we going to prevent that in keeping in line with this mandated requirement? If you're mandated to, re to download the app, you're going to focus more on the privacy implications. Are you going to um, bring the phone with you when you are out in public? So I think that there's some negative um, consequences of requiring that people download the app. And I'm not confident that it's going that it would result in um, more uh, data going to the um, healthcare providers uh, because I think that people will try to evade that requirement. Jens, anything to add to that? Same same issues would obtain over here. I think uh, at this point, uh, 
uh, there hasn't been discussion, uh, widespread discussion about mandating the use of, of any type of app at this point. Well, whether app, oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg. I was gonna say one of the discussion points is whether the app will operate on a centralized basis so that notices that a person has been exposed to uh, people who uh, may who are infected with the with the uh, coronavirus would go directly to a governmental authority to the health authority versus residing on their phone and then going directly to people with whom they had contact. And uh, in Germany, there was a big debate about this, and the government had originally wanted to go with the centralized approach, the government in the middle, uh, but because of the uh, concern about that approach, it went with the decentralized approach, uh, thinking that it will get a higher uptake because it gives people more control over data. It's a very good um, thing to think about. When people have more control, they are more likely to participate in, in a data sharing uh, effort that's designed to protect them. And I think that that makes a lot of sense to when we're thinking about what models to use. In a related vein, Greg, what do you think uh, the difference would be if something like this, rather than being mandatory, was a mandatory push out to all cell phones, perhaps as a system update, but gave people the ability to opt out after receiving that update? Do you think more comfortable with the technology at that point? I, I'm not sure how they're going to respond to that. You have the option of opting out. People will have a million questions, right? What's it going to mean to opt out? And uh, what's it going to mean to opt in? What happens to my data? Can I control it? If I become infected, can I control it or not? That's another, I think, important question. And then, Lisa, there are these other questions about um, uh, what is voluntary versus mandated. Could the app start as voluntary and then employers start saying, well, we want a safer workforce. So we employers, we're going to require it of our employees. Uh, could a stadium owner require it of everyone going into the stadium? So there's these varying um, degrees of voluntariness that we need to be thinking about uh, as these apps uh, come online. They are coming. And we are getting short on time. So let me pivot just a little bit to Andy uh, for a follow-up question. How much and what types of data should public health authorities be able to maintain after the public health emergency is over in order to conduct research and evaluation, learn from our experience and improve the outcomes for next time? You know, I think that's a great question. And of course, I mean, I think we have the luxury now of, of you know, having vast amounts of data uh, that can really help inform uh, our response not only to this current pandemic, but but a host of um, potential ones in the future. So, of course, we need to make sure that we have the ability to learn from it. Uh, I am not a, a health expert. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I would defer to you know those folks to identify the exact um, types of data sets that are that are really meaningful to maintain and to learn from that. But um, of course, any any sort of you know privacy regime that that is set up around this uh, should include uh, exceptions for academic research um, and to the extent that that data set is going to also include more sensitive identifiable data um, we include more privacy protections around it um, but that's not to say it shouldn't be used uh, and I just caution that you know using it for research uh, to better public health outcomes in the future it would I think everybody would agree is an acceptable use but You'd want to make sure also that that data is not being used for uh, other purposes that are outside of the public health context. And we are at, at time, but I want to add one final question for the group. Um, you all have seen that the Supreme Court has taken up the first CFAA case in years here in the United States. This question, I think, is probably for you, Greg. But if the government were to force a mandatory update uh, versus, say, the Apple and Google stores, but that rolled out to phones around the country, and I jail broke my phone to delete the app, would I be guilty of a computer crime? Uh, of course, <laughs> since this is being recorded. So the, the issue before the Supreme Court uh, relates to whether a mere violation of terms of service is um, going to be uh, what all that's needed for violating the Computer um, Fraud and Abuse Act. 
Um, our view is that a violation of terms of service shouldn't be enough, that you should have to overcome a technical uh, uh, impediment to gaining access. In other words, this hacking statute ought to require hacking in. Now, your question about uh, the update, I'm not sure. I, I need to think about that a little bit more, but the CFAA case is a really important one. We'll be filing a brief in that case uh, because we don't believe the case that everyone is violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act all the time because we're all violating terms of service all the time uh, as we use the different um, um, services that are available to us. And I will consider your response to me as, you know, attorney client privileged for that. And we'll just uh, leave it there. I, I know we are at time, um, but I do want to thank all of our panelists for joining us and to remind everybody that we have put together a new landing spot on our website for all of our coronavirus related work, which is cdt.org backslash coronavirus. We will be having another webinar in this series that's looking at contact tracing applications in the coronavirus context exploring whether Bluetooth applications can effectively notify people that they have had contact with somebody infected with COVID-19 that warrants either getting a test or self-quarantine. If these contact tra tracing apps are effective, what will be their cost in terms of privacy? Thank you all for joining us. For those of you who submitted questions that we weren't able to answer, we will try to follow up with you after this event, but please do feel free to continue reaching out to questions at cdt.org, and we'll do our best to build them into future webinars as well. Thank you all.